All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sound Words Bible Church. So glad that everybody's here and got some guests. We got a packed house. This is, I feel like we have a mega church right now. We got to watch out. Um, it, it is good to be back as we were out last week at Medina at Souls Arbor Church for the Bible Conference. And I, I am just super grateful for that time. It was extremely refreshing for me personally. And I, I just, I just wanted to let all of y'all know that since we've opened up, I'm just so thankful for you guys and the faithfulness that you've been to this local fellowship. Um, it, it is not something that I take for granted, and I just love, deeply love and appreciate every single one of you. It, you. You just being here is an encouragement for me to just keep holding forth the word of life that we have here. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. Uh, we have a birthday in the room. Mr. Obed turned 83 yesterday. Uh, and, it, and if you don't know, Obed, Obed's been, and we, we got it wrong last week. We said 55 years, but it's actually 45 years that he has been preaching and teaching the Word. And he's still going strong. He's an inspiration to me. And uh, just super grateful for that man right there. Faithful man of God. I also like to greet and welcome everybody that, that our Soundwords Bible Church family online, those of you tuning in, uh, the Aker family, the Fry family, um, everybody out there that tunes in faithfully. Roger, we, we love and appreciate you guys. Uh, a special hello to Lisa and Janine down in Mississippi. They actually showed up at the Bible conference, and it was so cool to meet them. Uh, so just wanted to give you guys a shout out. And uh, Paul, thank you so much for the portable uh, Bible stand. I'm going to be using this thing. I don't have enough space here, but super grateful for that. I love it. So um, just real quick, you know, our mission and our vision for the, our guests, you know, Sound Words Bible Church, it's just very simple. We're here to be just a, a beachhead here in the Middle Tennessee area, and our, our, our mission is very simple. The ABCs, the one, two, three of it is to, to, to make all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, and that is through the Word of God. And in our little booklet, you just open the page, it'll walk you through those one, two, threes and what we're about. And the vision really is just meeting people. It doesn't matter where, what walk of life you are. This word is sure, it stands forever, and the secret to unlocking it is rightly divine in the word of truth. And that's something that is deeply missing from Christianity today. You know, the enemy is on the clock 24-7. He's doing everything that he can to keep this book shut up on a desk, dusted off in the shelf where people aren't just not opening it and reading it. Not only that, but attacking the Word and muddying it up and confusing it and make it complicated where now people are, don't even believe that the Bible is the Word of God today. It's just some book that men wrote. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that with my whole heart. And our, our vision really is to carry out those one, two, threes. So we're going to sing a few songs. We like to just sing a few songs. So if you have the song booklet, we're going to page five. We'll sing a few songs, get our heart and minds ready uh, to dive into the scriptures. And I, I am amped up about today's message. So I'm just pre-warning you. If I get a little passionate, it's just, it's just excitement. I'm not mad or angry, okay? Just letting that just sit there. All right, we're in, uh, we're in page five. We're going to sing Blessed Assurance. All right, great singing, y'all. Will you... Bow with me in a word of prayer. Our great God and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we are just so humbled and grateful by your amazing love and your amazing grace that you poured out on us in 33 AD. God, we thank you for your word, your pure, perfect, and preserved word for us today. We thank you for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus, knowing that at the end, it's all taken care of, but Lord, we still got to deal with the day-to-day -day spiritual wickedness in high places. This morning, as we gather together, those of, you, those of the, that are here and those that are online, Lord, I just pray that we would just have an eagerness ready to just search your scriptures, Lord. Your word that it just have free course this morning and that ultimately your word be glorified and magnified in this place. We love you, Lord, and we give you thanks and praise. Pray this all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
All right, we're going to be starting in 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning. So if you have your Bibles or your smartphone or tablet, we're going to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read the passage of Scripture and then uh, that inspired today's message and then we're going to just dive right in. All right, so we're in 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, this is the Apostle Peter. In the context here, he's writing to the little flock. That's important for you to understand. When we're rightly dividing the word of truth, we're understanding the context, to the who, what, whom. Who is speaking? To whom are they speaking to? And what's being said? So Peter is writing to the little flock. He tells them in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation... Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved... Seeing you know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. All right, so in... Um, the, the context here, you know, Peter, this is the second letter that Peter had to write. He wrote two letters, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. And in this second letter, and in this third chapter, he's having to explain to the little flock. Remember, you, you just look at the Bible as a whole. And when you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's just the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews only. And when you get to Acts chapter 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, you read about that. Peter addressing that little flock and they're expecting the kingdom to come. They were literally expecting that promised kingdom, in he that, 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 that new Jerusalem that would come down and be established on the earth. They were expecting that to happen in their time frame, and it didn't. And so then Peter's having to explain all these things. Look, this is what's going on. And, and this, this is after God finally risen up the apostle Paul, gave to him the revelation of the mystery, and... Peter is acknowledging the mystery that was given to Paul. And the, the little flock, they, were, they actually received it. They read all, his, all the scriptures, but they knew, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul telling them, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That little flock had to understand that this was not part of their inheritance. This is not the kingdom that was to come, but God was doing something with the Gentiles, with the gospel of the grace of God. And this is something that I think is just, it, it, it is not talked about amongst Christianity today. This isn't normal conversations that you have with folks. And I titled today's message, Understanding Paul's Epistles. And, and it, it is inspired by that verse, you, you read that in verse 15 and 16, what Peter said, Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as in also all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, speaking in them, and speaking in them of these things, and which sing, some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. So Peter acknowledges that Paul's epistles, they were very hard for the little flock to understand. Why? Because this stuff was a mystery. There was no such thing as the rapture before Paul. That was not a thing. There's no such thing as a heavenly inheritance in heavenly places. There's no promise of that outside of Paul's epistles. There's no such thing as eternal security. There was no sealing of the Holy Ghost outside of Paul's epistles. So I want to drill down into a couple, four things, and there's a lot of material that I'm going to go over, and I might have to do a whole entire series of this. But the four things that I want to kind of drill into today is, one, I want to talk about the purpose of the book of Acts, two, the mindset of Christ, three, the wisdom of God, and four will be the unsearchable riches. So 
I just want to just slow down a bit because I'm getting excited. <laughs> and pause. Because what I've observed, and, and this is from my 80 years experience of within going all the various different religion, religions and denominational backgrounds of Christianity, is that in those first eight years where I spent a lot of my time every Sunday was in these four books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? That's where I spent all of my time. And I got really good at those things, and I tried to live them out, but something was terribly wrong because I couldn't do it. I was the one that literally, I'm like, all right, if my right hand causes me to sin, cut it off. I literally was like, oh, God, I don't know if I could do this, and I couldn't do it, right? And you talk about the gouging out your eye, I would be a blind man right now if I did that. Nobody can keep the law over here. That was what Jesus told them. If you want to be perfect, keep the law and the commandments. And a lot of Christianity is stuck there today. They're trying to do that thing. They're trying to cast out demons. They're trying to make the, the lame, heal the lame, make the, the, them walk and cause the blind to see. And then there's, all, there's churches out there that are trying that this morning right now. And they're getting really amped up. There's probably still music still going. And uh, there's people probably prophesying over them right now. So all that stuff is going on today. And I'm just pointing this out that a majority of Christianity is stuck in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They get to the book of Acts, and this is what happens. They, he, they read 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then they just stay there. They never go past Acts chapter 4. The thing about Acts, if you just read it, it is a transitional book. It's to help you. It, it, you see the first part is just the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews only. And then when you get to the very end, it's the gospel of the grace of God to Jews and Gentiles. And that's huge because God wasn't going to Gentiles prior to, the, to Acts chapter 13. Just imagine for a second, if you were to remove the book of Acts from the Bible, I want you to just... Just imagine this for a second. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you don't read the book of Acts, and then you read the book of Romans, and you see Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, you're going to be like, what in the world? Who is Paul? And then, wait a second. You just read 39 books of your Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's all dealing with just Jews in Jerusalem. And then the first book you read is the book of Romans. Why in the world is there a book of Romans in your Bible. Do you see how drastic that difference is? I mean, you, you have a ministry to Jews and all of a sudden, boom, you have a Roman city. It's a Gentile city. Those The rest of the books of Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, they're all Gentile cities. If you don't have the book of Acts and you don't read it, you're not going to understand that there was a change in, in, in Acts chapter 9 with the Apostle Paul. It's the first time you're going to read in your Bible that God chose a man as a chosen vessel to the Gentiles. First time ever. You remove, if you just remove, let's just, I want to imagine this. Imagine this for a second. Remove the book of Acts, Romans through Philemon. If you were to read Genesis, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get to Hebrews... That would be an absolute perfect, it, it, it would just be perfect. It would make complete sense. I mean, just go to Hebrews. Just go to, look, look at it. Hebrews chapter 1. So you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're reading about Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. And you're seeing him do all these miracles and these healings. And, and these were approving him of God. And then you get to Hebrews, right? And then you have the death, burial, resurrection. You see it there at the very end of all those accounts. And then you get to Hebrews chapter 1. It says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners... Uh, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. It just makes perfect sense. It's in complete harmony. And, it, it, and it's still dealing with this transition from being under the law, which they were in times past, to that time frame that Jeremiah talked about, the prophet Jeremiah, where God's going to put the law in their hearts and their minds. It's in perfect harmony. But it, 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 and this is why rightly dividing people just get, I mean, if you've never heard this before, it makes your head tilt. 
it just it contradicts everything that you've probably been brought up with. And this is something that I think that Christians today, they, they, it's crazy that, that, that what we read there in Peter, the unstable and unlearned rest. I mean, just the other week, someone said, Paul is the apostle apostle. Paul is the apostle apostle. I didn't even engage. I'm just like, I can't, I can't even, I can't even talk. Let me ask you a question. If, if, Paul's the, if Paul's really a false apostle, what does 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy say? Let's go there. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1. It says, Paul. Who's Paul an apostle of? An apostle of Jesus Christ. By who? By the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by what? By the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. It's God's will that Paul be your apostle for today. And if you're going to disregard that, you're disregarding the, war, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's amazing to me how God designed his book perfectly for you to read it cover to cover that when you get to the book of acts you see that transition so that when you get to romans who finally i mean you understand that god is doing something different with paul paul had his name as a token second thessalonians three seventeen. paul says the salutation with mine own hand which is a token in every epistle, so I write. So that's why you see Paul's name. I believe it because of the word of God. What it says that Paul literally hand wrote his name, Paul, an apostle, Paul, at the very first 13 books that he wrote. That's why when you get to Hebrews, it says what? God. Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. And you've got a ton of super smart theologians and all these people that have these PhDs and divinity and master, all this stuff, and they will argue tooth and nail to say that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Why is that a problem? Well, when you get to the book of Hebrews, eternal security is out the door, and all of the things that Paul just said was by grace and is a gift, it no longer is about you freely receiving the grace of God. It's you enduring until the end and doing works for your salvation. Black and white, clear and day. It's clear as day. So the purpose of the book of Acts is to help you understand that there was a transition from, the, from God's ministry to that little flock for that earthly inheritance, that kingdom of heaven here on earth, versus... The revelation of the mystery that was given to the Apostle Paul, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest through the scriptures and through the prophets. See, there's searchable riches in Paul's epistles where he explains a lot of these things that are part of the mystery. And then you've got these unsearchable riches of Christ, which we'll get to, that you cannot find outside of Paul's epistles, especially in Ephesians and Colossians. So I want to now transition to the second thing, which was the mind of Christ. And this was a gold nugget that I got from last week. So let's go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I know we've got food in the room and I'm already smelling it and you guys are like, I'm just going to need to pay attention and stay on point here. I only have two more hours to get through. Just kidding. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice what it says. Paul writes to the Corinthians in verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I want to talk to you a little bit about that mind of Christ. And I, I'm going to start off by telling you that I think a lot of people err in this thing. And where the err is, is I think a lot of people have this thinking of, all right, if I believe in God, that means I must be saved. That means that all the thoughts that I have must be of God and that I just have the mindset of Christ all the time. All right, that's where the error is. I'm going to tell you that we have the mind of Christ 
through Romans through Philemon. And this is something that Mark Rumfellow touched on, and he was spot on. Because it's amazing. I couldn't stop thinking about this all week. You just read Romans through Philemon, those, those 13 books. And you, Oba talked about it last weekend. If you just read three chapters a day, you'll be through the whole entire, or the whole entire 13 books in 28 days. You just keep reading it over and over and over. And you know what's going to happen? Is you're going to start thinking about those scriptures. And you know what, you know what, you know what you're realizing? You realize what you're doing? You're now thinking with the mind of Christ because those are his words. And it's incredible that we have that, especially in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says, let this mind be in you. We touched on this two weeks ago. Let's go there. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Paul, right into the Philippians, he tells them, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in his fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given the name which is above every name. There is nowhere that you can find that mind of Christ right there from what we just read outside of Paul's epistles. Nowhere. You think about it. God sending down his son to be the king of Israel. He could have easily, and you read about it in Psalms, he's going to rule with that iron scepter. You know, everyone wants to just paint God and Jesus as he's just this God of love. It's like, you know, kind of going back to like the, the hippie days, you know, love, peace. It's just, it's all good and groovy. No, he's, he's going to come to this earth that second time. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be love and peace. And it's going to be, there's going to be a war. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be ugly. But what I'm trying to get at here was, is this mindset of Christ. What's incredible to me is that Almighty God revealed this mystery unto our glory and that we can now understand the mind of Christ through Romans through Philemon. That's incredible. That blows my mind. It really does. And the more I read about it, the more I read about his humility, he, he could have easily just said, oh, bow down and worship me. No, what did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient in the death. He endured a horrible death at Calvary. And no movie can depict it. The, 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 the shame, the plucking out of his beard, the stripping him naked, nailing him to a cross. And he could have easily just fought back. He could have easily come down from that cross after hanging up for six hours and say, yep, I'm done. I'm done taking all the sins of the world on me. But no, he went all the way till the end. Why? Because it was God's will for his life that he would give himself for our sins. If Jesus Christ would have never gone to the cross, died and resurrected, we would have absolutely no hope. No hope. But God did it anyways. Why? Because even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And I'm not talking just Jews, his own people, his own sins. I'm talking about us heathen, ungodly people, those that are strangers from the covenants of promise, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, who were once without hope, without Christ, and without God in the world. But now, by the blood of the cross, we've been made nigh to God. Praise God. That's amazing. We would not know that if it wasn't for the mind of Christ and the revelation of the mystery through the Apostle Paul. You would not find that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You would not find that through Hebrews through Revelation. Don't take my word for it. Go search the scriptures. Prove me wrong. Because that's what happened when I met this man. I thought he was outside of his head and he was losing it. I thought he had a couple screws loose. But you know what I did? I showed up every Thursday with my pen and paper. I wrote down every single Bible verse that he was saying. And then I would go and I would open up my Bible and, and I'd get home and I'd start searching the scriptures, trying to prove him wrong. And guess what I couldn't do? I couldn't prove him wrong. Praise God. 
Now I got a faithful man that I can mark because we need faithful men. And if you're going to tell me that you don't need a faithful man, you don't need a preacher to understand the Bible, well, what you're saying is completely counterintuitive of what the scriptures tell me because we need guides. We need faithful men of God. We need preachers to preach the word of God, rightly divine the word of truth, so that we can understand this thing. The mind, you just think about that word, the mind. Mind these things. I want to define mind. Mind is intention. It's purpose. It's design. It's the will and affection. Forty times you can read the word mind in Paul's epistles. And you think about that, that will. God reveals his will to you in Romans through Philemon. It's right there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. And what I'm about to tell you could save you hundreds of thousands of dollars, so you don't need to go buy all these other books to try and figure out what the will of God is for your life. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 2. Let's go there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I think I might have like taken a Red Bull or something. I don't know why I've got all this energy. <laughs> Uh, I didn't have a Red Bull. I didn't even drink my coffee. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Well, hold up. I want to read the first two verses. Let's back up. Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort thee, therefore, now Paul's talking to Timothy here, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Side note, we should be praying for these things. I don't care who's sitting in that seat and that president's seat. We need to be praying for them, especially for those in this country and in all, those in all those in other countries that are tuning in. You need to be praying for your leadership, right? And what's the prayer? That ye may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Because I think there's going to come a time where we're not going to be able to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now it's going to explain th a thing or two about the God our Savior there. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It is God's will that you be saved. And guess what? This isn't anything new. He wants you to understand your Bible. He actually wants you to understand the scriptures. He doesn't want you to be confused. If you're confused about the scriptures, I'm going to tell you one thing right now. That is not something that is a, 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 just a, nat a flesh and blood thing. You're dealing with a spiritual thing there with the enemy. Satan is working overtime to keep you ignorant of God's word. Right. Ten times, I think Paul says something about ignorance in the scriptures. I would not have you be ignorant, brother. And then he explains the scriptures. God's will is to have you be saved by the gospel of Christ. Christ dying for our sins, being buried and resurrected from the dead the third day for our justification. You putting your faith and trust in that. And then to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And I believe that is to understand the whole entire Bible by rightly dividing the word of truth. Knowing what God's doing today versus what God did in times past versus what God's going to do in the ages to come. Because what God is doing today is completely unique. We're living in a time that was not prophesied about. It is a mystery time. And God is forming the church, the body of Christ. Those that have put their faith and trust in God are now part of this great mystery the church, the body of Christ. We are literally members of his flesh and of his bones. I truly don't believe that we can really grasp our mind around that. But we have this inheritance in heavenly places, and none of this is for our glory. It's according to the riches and the glory and the praise of his glory. You can't have the mind of Christ if you're not reading the scriptures, if you're not studying your Bible, and if you don't have a rightly dividing preacher, teacher, you're never going to be able to get this. Unless you're Dan Gross, which is just a miracle that he came to understand this stuff. you know. But then he got connected with everybody else. And that's just a side note. So I want to talk about this wisdom of God now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Hang a left again. First Corinthians chapter two, 
verse 7 and 8. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, he tells them, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Last week, remember, I touched on at the Bible conference, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. And I touched on three of them. This, this wisdom and the way I like to talk about this is, you read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, it's very clear that this is just, God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And this mystery that is revealed, it's so simple. God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. This thing, I'm telling you, it's the most common sense approach to understanding the scriptures. But if you don't have it and you don't understand the mind of Christ, it's not common sense. That's why you got to do that workman part and, and study. You know, open up the scriptures and study and reading. But rightly dividing, I'm just going to tell you right now, rightly dividing the word of truth it never was a thing until Paul. There was no need to rightly divide the scriptures until Paul. That's, but, but when you finally get the revelation of the mystery and you start understanding these things, well, now there's a need to rightly divide the word of truth because these things are black and white when you really examine and put a magnifying glass and look at it. I mean, just look at Jesus Christ in Matthew 10, Five and six, sending out the apostles, the twelve apostles, go not into the way of the Gentiles. So, Peter, James, John, those twelve, guess where they didn't go? To Gentiles. That's a command, part of their ministry. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then you take a magnifying glass, you get the Romans, chapter 11, 13, Paul says, I'm an apostle of the Gentiles. I'm magnifying mine office. Okay, these are two different apostleships. Which one am I supposed to put myself under? Well, I know I'm a dog. Like I'm the heathen Gentile. I'm half Filipino. And I, I'm sure you go back and look at my ancestors. They definitely aren't part of the 12 tribes. So by natural default, I'm going to fall under the category of Paul. Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles. It's, it, it, it's just simple. It's, it's easy math. Living under the law, versing un, living, vers, uh, living under grace, those things are just completely like night and day. And when you take that night and day, that's just, just the same as taking the, the lost sheep, the little flock, the house of Israel versus the body of Christ. They're, they're two different things. But what's happening is Satan has completely blurred these lines. He's dumbed down the word. He's taken out rightly divine word of the truth. So people aren't separating these things. They're blending them together, and so now they're trying to live this janked up, I'm under the law, but I'm also under grace life. And it's so confusing. Because it's like, oh, this bad thing happened to me. That's because I shouldn't have done that sin yesterday. That's what it was. Man, I'm getting punished for that. But I'm under grace. Hold on. Wait, what? Like, that doesn't make sense. I mean, if you really just break down under the law versus under grace. I'm asking you right now, what are you living under? If you're under the grace and your salvation and you're saying, I'm saved because of this. I'm saved because I was water baptized as a baby or, you know, when I was in college. Um, I repented of my sins and uh, I, I confessed my sins. That's, that's how I'm saved, you know. I'm going to tell you right now, you're putting yourself under the law, okay? Now, if, if you're saying that your salvation is a spiritual baptism that you received that the moment that you believed and trusted in Christ, death, burial, resurrection for your sins, and that it's by grace through faith that you're saved, mm -hmm. you're under grace. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. And the whole entire meat of it is that if you're believing right now that that's what your salvation is dependent upon, you are not rightly dividing the word of truth.
That's what that equation means. Now, if you're doing these things, you understand that's by grace through faith. The moment you believe and trusted, you were spared, but you're, for by one spirit, are we all baptized in the one body? Well, now, yes, you are rightly dividing the word of truth. This is something that Paul addressed to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This, the Corinthians, they, they had a lot of struggles, right? They, they were very fleshly. They were babes in Christ. They were questioning Paul's apostleship, as many people are today. And what he tells the Corinthians, after they're completely fighting him tooth and nail on all of these doctrines, he tells them in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, Prove your own selves. Know ye not your know ye not your own selves? How that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So Paul, and this this is a great thing. If you're questioning your salvation, the best thing that you should do right now is go and examine yourself. Don't just examine yourself like look at my life. I think I was saved there. Uh, oh, I don't know. No. Examine yourself through the lens of the scriptures. Examine yourselves through the lens of the mind of Christ through Romans to Philemon. When I did this for my own self, it was October 15 of 2015. I realized that my faith, I, I believe and trusted originally. I knew I was saved. But then what happened is some man came along the way and told me that I was in the wrong and that I needed to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and that I needed to go and confess my sins and then that I needed to make Jesus Lord of my life and then that Jesus was knocking on the door of my heart and that I needed to open and let him in and that I needed to come down in an altar and I needed to bend my knee and dedicate my life as a servant of Jesus Christ. And all these things just happened and it just took one man and another and another and I wasn't receiving and searching the scriptures. I was just receiving because, oh, he's a Christian, so he must know the will of God. So I just need to just take whatever he says to the bank. But that's not what the Bereans did there in Acts 17, 11. No, they received the word of readiness of mind. They received what Paul was preaching. Then they went in their homes, opened up their Bibles, searched the scriptures to verify whether or not it was true. And what did the scriptures say about them? They were more noble. Noble Christians receive the word and search the scriptures daily. Not noble Christians don't receive the word with readiness in mind. They show up, they eat, and they go along their way for the rest of the week. And they probably forget everything that happened the day before. But they do remember, man, that one worship song was incredible and the presence of God showed up there. I can't wait for next week. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and then we'll wrap things up. I can see the hangry eyes starting to happen. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 8, Paul writes to the Ephesians, he tells them, Unto me, that me there is Paul, we know that because you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, it says Paul, so we know who's writing. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. This is just a side note. ESV, NIV, NLT, they remove by Jesus Christ out of verse 9. That is a big deal. And so when you start having conversations with people and they say God did not create all things by Jesus Christ, well there's no wonder why they think that. Okay? And I don't strive with them. Take it from me. Just let them go their merry way. If any, man, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's what Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 38. But this grace was given to no one other than Paul to preach among the Gentiles, you and I, all nations, 
the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. I'm going to tell you right now why it's unsearchable riches is because you can't find the writings that Paul talks about, the doctrine that he teaches. You cannot find it over here, and you definitely will not find it over there. One that you will not find is the church, the body of Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. Paul writes, This is a great mystery. He compares the husband and the wife relationship, right? Then he describes the relationship between church and, and Christ, who is the head of the church. He tells them, This is a great mystery in verse 32, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nobody talks about the body of Christ except for Paul. Don't take my word for it. Check it out. Go read Hebrews through Revelation. Go read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 1st, 2nd Peter, uh, James, Jude. Guess what you're not going to find? You're not going to find the body of Christ. Why? Because that's not part of the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is about Christ coming as king, and that nation is going to be a kingdom of priests and kings. They're going to rule the earth forever in that little plot of land. Paul's gospel, the grace of God, says, I'm going to take all of the people that, are, that were just outside of the promises of God, the ones that Christ used to wipe out before Israel. I mean, go read the Old Testament. If you don't think that's bloody and there's horrid stories, there's tons of them. All right? It's not like what they put out in, the, in those children books about David and Goliath. And it's pretty brutal when you look at what, what David did to Goliath there. But the beauty of it is that we were once enemies of God, but now by the cross we've been reconciled to God. Hallelujah, praise God. Now we don't got to worry about that thing. And now God has spiritually baptized us into the body of Christ. We've become members of his body. Where's Christ sitting right now? Right hand of God. Far above all heavens. Where are we going the moment we die? We're going for a trip. We're going for a trip. You read there in Philippians, it, Paul writes that Christ was given the name above every name. You read in the book of Psalms, God knows every single star in the universe and has given them all a name. And Christ is above all that. And that's where we're going. Amen. I can't wait. It's going to be exciting. Amen. The unsearchable riches of Christ, it's that body of Christ. It's that heavenly inheritance. It's the great catching up of the church, the body of Christ. Meeting the, meeting the Lord in the air, right there in First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be. We're not coming back. And praise God, because I cannot stand this place. <laughs> I'm like, ready to go, especially in 2020. Especially in 2020, I'm like, that'd be great. I mean, there's everybody, you, you read it, all these prophets, and everybody's trying to predict it, that Christ is coming and the rapture. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to keep doing what Paul tells us. Water, so. Water, so. Water, so. God giveth the increase. We need to preach the word. Why do we need to preach the word? Because sound doctrine is so hard to find. People are having to go, thank God for the internet, because you can find people like that. But most people don't have this luxury. They're sitting at home. They're starving for fellowship. My heart breaks for them because I was there. I know exactly what they felt, and we should be grateful for this, that we have this. We shouldn't take this for granted. We should ask each other, hey, I want to have you come over. Let's have fellowship. Let's eat. And hey, let's talk about the scriptures. That's what life's about, sound doctrine, sound words. And guess what? There's people here that we need to invite. There's friends that we need to say, hey, why don't you come along? Come along, check this out. Let's dig into it. And then you're able to take them out free. And then you're able to dig and have conversations with them. People are starving for the Word of God. I'm telling you, they are starving. Whether they know it or they don't, they're hungry. And I hear that over and over. So 
We talked about the purpose of Acts, that transitional book, so you understand God's doing something different. We talked about the mind of Christ that's revealed in Romans through Philemon. We talked about the wisdom of God, all those things that were hidden in God, revealed to the Apostle Paul, revealed to us, ordained for our glory. And we talked about the unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't find these things outside of Paul's epistles. Rightly divide the word truth. Cut it straight. Make it clear and simple for people to understand. It's not rocket science. Anybody can understand this. You don't need a PhD in whatever it is that you need some recommendation or commendation from men for you to understand this book. A 12-year-old can pick this up and, and understand it. And I think there's a man, young man, what? Brand, Brandon? Is it, I'm going blank. Brandon. Drew. Drew? Drew? And then Brandon as well. You guys are the future right now. It's going to take someone like Drew and Brandon and all these younger men right now to get this thing so that we they can carry this torch on for the next generation. That was one of the things that shot this fire in me to pick up the reins because I was looking around. And I don't see anybody getting in here, studying it, understanding it. It's so important. I hope that YouTube's around and that these videos can be around for my daughters when they're around so that they can actually have sound words and sound doctrine. All right, so get in the book. Get yourself an authorized King James Bible. I can't stress that enough. I'm not going to go into that one, but get in it. Read Acts through Philemon. So read everything that happens because most people know what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is. They just haven't gotten to the book of Acts. So read that. Compare. Compare the scriptures. Compare what Paul teaches versus what Peter, James, and John taught. Look at it. Even here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, look what Jesus Christ taught to the Israel versus what Christ taught Paul to the body of Christ. Compare it. And then when you compare it, believe what Paul says. Make it in your mind. Just, just make it. Just I believe this. And then trust in it. And what's going to happen is the Word of God is going to work effectually in you and through you to do the work of the ministry. Let's go there to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 13, and we'll wrap things up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 13. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, so that's, he's talking about him, not Peter and James and John there, which you received it us. You received it not as the words of men, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in also in you that believe. That's it. That's all we got to do. We got to get in the book, read it, study it, believe it. And the Word of God is what's quick and powerful. It's just going to go. You can't help but share the Word of God with people. It just naturally flows. If you're not studying the Scriptures and not memorizing the Scriptures, I'm going to tell you right now, the best thing you can do is write them on note cards. Post them around your home. Put it on the dashboard of your card. Memorize that Scripture. I try to do that as much as I can. And I try to jam-pack these messages with much Scripture as possible because I know that it's the Word of God that's going to work effectually in our hearts and minds. All right, that's it. I think I've gone way over and it's time to eat. Let's close in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the unsearchable riches of Christ, the mind of Christ that we have in Christ Jesus, that we have your words, Lord, that we can go and search these things in the scriptures and understand them and that we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Pray this all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Amen.